Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Vicki Yo. We need a midget podium up here. Hi, I'm Vicki. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm grateful that I don't walk up to the newcomer men anymore. <laughs> I'm recovering, 13 stepper. And I, and I just want to say to you, Gene, thank you so much. Doesn't he look amazing? Unbelievable. Thank you. When I came in the first of November and I looked up at that board and I saw that you would ask Heidi and Mikey and David and I'm like, oh my God, I've got to be on the month with all of them. Oh man. Made me even more nervous. Next time to get some newcomers. <laughs> Uh, but I am, I'm really, really, I'm very touched and honored to be somebody that people want to listen to, really. My parents told me to shut up my whole life, so to have people who are here by choice and not court-ordered is a, quite an honor. Some of y'all are court-ordered, and I hope you enjoy it anyway. <laughs> I... Uh, and also, for the people who are here, really, be, just because you love and support me. I never imagined my life would be like this. That people would love me in that way. Nikki changed her schedule for me. and I know a lot of you guys had to move things around and be here. I'm very, very honored. And... I brought a lot of tissues. (laughs) I want to wish Liz, where's Liz? Happy anniversary, Liz. I know today's your anniversary. And uh, I also want to thank my marketing department, my publicists, who have been terrorizing me for a couple of weeks. Brian, thank you. I'm going to kill you. And Jim P., and Mikey and then Denise would all start the applause every meeting that I was in. So they've been terrorizing me for a couple of weeks. So let me use this opportunity to remind you that Mike S., right there in the hat, he's speaking next Saturday. <laughs> Mikey will be in here finding new and improved ways to use the word wacko in a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> That's his favorite word. He's one of my favorite wackos. So I know he's got a great story. He has a wonderful way with words. So I'll be announcing that every day this week. I'm going to cancel all my appointments so I can come to the noon meeting every day and announce that. But if I'm not here, Brian will help me, right, Brian? Thank you. Well, I, I, like I said, I'm just very honored to be a sober member. This is my home group. And uh, when I look around the room, I see a lot of people who have touched my life in just amazing ways that you don't even know. And so I, I'm just really grateful to be with a group of people that are my friends and my peers and uh, there's a lot of other places I could be, but this is where I want to be tonight. So, And this is, if you're a visitor, this is the best group you will ever go into, really. If you're looking for a home group, please consider this group. Uh, I, uh, When I first got sober, I, I used to love to go to speaker meetings. You know, I like to be a voyeur on other people's lives. 
And I would hear these horrible stories. You people were horrible. I mean, you've been in prison. You've been prostitutes. You'd shot up drugs. And I was just from North Carolina. I, you know, I was looking for a good time. And that wasn't really how I set about doing it. And I just couldn't believe your very terrible stories. And I started sponsoring this girl who had been, um, who had been all of like all of you. She had shot up drugs and she had taken her kids into Overtown in Miami in the ghetto and got drugs and prostituted. And I just thought, my story is so boring. And I swear to God, I thought, I'm going to have to go out again and get some better stories because I don't have any good stories. And to me, the best people were the ones that could tell the best stories. Like Lee's one of the best... He, it's not just a storyteller. He tells from his heart. But I, I've always admired that ability to really hold people captive with a story. So this is going to suck. <laughs> I just tend to flip from one thought to another. So bear with me. <laughs> and uh, I was uh, born and raised in Greensboro, North Carolina. And uh, the first speaker I ever heard happened to be from Greensboro, North Carolina. And we got drunk in the same place. <laughs> it was the weirdest thing. But um, I was uh, born to a very southern uh, mother who told me to talk like a lady. And I still can't pull that off. She'd be horrified to know that Terry Lamond is my sponsor. I told Terry, the reason I can't clean up my mouth is because my sponsor talks worse than me, if you know... <laughs> If you know Terry, you know she doesn't she doesn't utter a sentence without a bad word in it. I promised Lee I wouldn't cuss, but I'll try not to cuss tonight. But my mother was a lady, <laughs> and my father was a jerk, and um, <laughs> and I was the second of five kids, and um, and I was. Uh, I was born with this thing. You aren't gonna, you probably won't know what this is, but I was born with this condition called, it's called sensory processing disorder. And it's, if you've ever heard of somebody that have it, they probably drive you up the wall. It's, I have all these sensitivities to lights and to colognes, a lot of colognes give me cologne, um, headaches and, um, and I was itchy. My parents thought I was allergic to wool. They had a wool blanket on me for three days as a baby, and I cried for three days. And, you know, back then, you were just a, a problem. You were a behavior problem. But I was in a constant state of overstimulation all the time. If you've ever known anybody, the way I diagnose it is they complain all the time, and they don't sleep very well. So if that fits you, you might have it. But today you might think that I have bipolar or something, or <laughs> or a, I have a bad case of ADHD too. So you combine that, and and I have to say I would never want a kid like me. My mother put a curse on me, and she said, "I hope your all of your children are just like you." So I got my tubes tied. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And knowing me, I would have, they would have been in treatment or jail or something if I'd had kids. Thank you, God, I didn't have kids, but, and, um, but I really was a difficult kid. I think I would have been a very, very difficult child to parent. And as a result of that, I mean, I don't condone child abuse, but today as I look back on how I am as a person, I know why my father used to beat the crap out of me. I mean, he had some of it. All of the mem members of my family have a touch of it. I have it the worst of anybody. And um, and so it affected what I ate. It affected what I wore. I still had to cut the tags out of shirts a lot because they just, you know, like if I, I didn't know I had this for many years. I didn't know what it was. I just thought I was weird. Well, I know I'm weird, but I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I know that I drank to sleep a lot because I couldn't sleep. But um, I remember just as a kid, my mother would, if one of the things is everything has to be even, like obsessive compulsive disorder. And if my mother would put one of my pigtails higher or tighter than the other or she tied one of my shoes tighter than the other, 
I literally would have a meltdown, and one of the things that kids would this do is we have really bad temper tantrums. And so if you're a parent and you don't understand this, and parents don't understand this, I see kids that have it all the time, and the parents think the kid is misbehaving. The best thing to do is beat the crap out of him. And my father whipped that belt out all out of him. I cannot even tell you how many times he pulled that belt out on me to try to get me to behave, but all it did is it made all that energy, it needs to go out, and I just contained it. So I was just a mess, you know, like a nervous mess my whole life. And, uh, but when I got in kindergarten, I was, um, when it, it was weird because when I was at home, I was this horrible, horrible child. My mother used to, there was a nursery rhyme, and and she would sing it to me all the time. And when she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was hard. And my mother would remind me of that nursery rhyme or whatever it was and all the time. And because I would go from, you know, polishing all the doorknobs to just literally throwing a meltdown. My mother learned that the way to stop my temper tantrums was to throw water in my face. And it would stop me, but it didn't, you know, I didn't have a way to kind of detox myself of all the buildup of everything. So, but usually when I would walk out of the house, I was like an angel. I mean, I walked out of my house and everybody loved me. Inside my house, everybody hated me because I was the kid that got dad mad and parents fighting and the other kids running for cover so they wouldn't get hit. And so... I really, I know this sounds really weird. I know my parents loved me, but they didn't like me. And they really didn't like me pretty much my whole life, even after I was in recovery. I've always been able to measure my own growth by how my relationship with my dad was. And I'll, you know, describe my dad and mine's relationship through the years because it was very contentious. But um, when I walked into kindergarten, I was always the teacher's pet. And at the school, everybody just adored me. And I was very popular, even though I absolutely hated myself. I thought I was just horrible. You know, I believed what I interpreted my parents' behavior to mean. And one day, um, there was a home ec class in my uh, in the high school next door to my kindergarten and the home ec class came and they um, observed the children. They were trying to learn about child development and they picked me as the most ideal child. (laughs) And they called up my mother and wanted her (laughs) to give a speech on child rearing. (laughs) And she said she never lied so much in her whole life. And, uh, and she said that day when she came home from talking to the home ec class, she did, she was a teacher for about a year until she married my dad. So she made up a whole bunch of stuff she learned in college. And, um, and she said that day, you know, I was very impatient. I'm still impatient. But that day I came home from school and the door, the screen door was locked and she didn't get to the door fast enough and I almost tore the door off that off the hinges because all right, having one of my little fits, let me in. I don't know why I wanted to get in the house so badly, but I did. So anyway, my school career was, I was pretty smart, but I couldn't concentrate very well, so I didn't make great grades. But and all the way through school, I was always one of the popular kids. I was the president of my elementary school and um, in junior high school, I was a cheerleader all four years because that was my identity. I thought, if I can be a cheerleader, people will like me. And I think my whole life has been, if I can just blah, 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 people will love me. And, you know, speaking of prostituting myself, I really sold out on myself and who I was to have the illusion that people liked me when in reality I didn't know it, but they already did. And so... But all through junior high school, I was, um, you know, I wasn't a good kid. I was one of the wild cheerleaders. I was probably the wildest of all the kids, of all the, you know, popular kids. But 
And then in high school, I was a cheerleader, and I was vice president of the school. And um, But I, I just, like I said, I, I really wanted to be dead. I hated myself so much. I was overweight. I started gaining weight at about 12, and I was a little chunky booger. And, um, and I just... I mean, no matter how many awards I got and how many people liked me and how many cheers I could do, it, it just wasn't enough. You know how it is when you can't fill up the cup. You just can't fill up that cup of self-esteem when it's ripped out of you growing up. And so um, I took my, my parents, my parents, my father drank alcoholically when I was growing up, but I'm not, I don't think he was an alcoholic, but my mother didn't drink alcoholically when I was growing up, but was an alcoholic. But we never had alcohol in our house because my grandmother was a teetotaler and and she was a church lady. And, you know, my parents didn't even let my grandmother know that they drank. So I was never around alcohol. And when I was babysitting one time when I was 14 years old, I took my first drink of alcohol and they had a bottle of liquor sitting out on the counter And I took that thing off and I just swigged it like that because I'd never tasted it, never been around it. And I thought I was going to die. I mean, I couldn't catch my breath. And I thought, oh, my God, why do people drink this? It's terrible. And so, you know, I I didn't really get the point. And so um, I didn't drink again until I was 16 years old. And back in North Carolina, you could... um, drink beer and wine at 18 years old. And so I went to a party. Uh, I was a sophomore in high school, and I went to a party with all the seniors. And uh, one of the seniors bought me a six-pack of tall boys. And I drank the whole six-pack. And I got out of my mind drunk. I puked. I was I was just disgustingly sick. I was throwing up. I got up the next morning and I thought, that was so much fun. I can't wait to do it again. That's how we are, you know. Alcoholics, we feel like crap. Oh my God, that was fun. And even though I didn't even like the taste of it, uh, I hated the taste of alcohol, but um, I shared in a meeting yesterday, I loved how I felt and I hated how I acted. And so alcohol made me feel beautiful and skinny and fun and confident. And so, and I just, I just have always wanted to have fun all my life. I just want to have fun. And so I drank every time I could. I mean, there was nothing around my house. But when I was a senior in high school, one of my friend's parents would have all these parties at her house and her parents drank every night. And I thought that was normal. I'm like, When I get to be an adult, I'm going to drink every night because Catherine's parents, they're fun and they're healthy. By God, we're going to drink every night because I thought that was normal. I thought that's what everybody did, everybody but my family did. And so uh, we would have the best time at their house. We could smoke. I used to smoke. And we could smoke and drink over at my friend Catherine's house and all these parties, and we would have a blast. And then I went off, uh, I got engaged in my senior year to my high school boyfriend, and he was the football player, and I was the little chunky cheerleader, and we were going to get married, and I was going to be a secretary, and he was going to go somewhere on a football scholarship, and so we got engaged, and um, and so he was going to go to NC State, and I was going to go to Meredith College, which if you know anything about Meredith College, it was a place I was going to control all my impulses because it was a Baptist girls' school. And I didn't want to be tempted, and I was afraid I would be tempted. And so I chose my college because of my alcoholism and my addiction to cheating. And so... <clears throat> We got engaged, and um, his mother found out about us, and she wouldn't let him go to NC State. And so he went to another school. So anyway, we broke up. He told me years later at a high school reunion that he, I'm sorry I have to cuss because he said the word. He called, He said, I'm like, why did you break up with me? He said, because you were a fat bitch. <laughs> God, thanks. I'm glad I have a little self-esteem now. That didn't really bother me. 
So anyway, I'll tell you about our 40th high school reunion in a minute. <laughs> I'm not into revenge or anything. It just felt good. <laughs> So anyway, uh, went off to college, drank all through college, graduated in three years, uh, lived in my hometown, kept drinking out of my mind. One night I was drunk, I was living with these three girls and I got drunk. And um, you know how when you're drunk and the room is spinning around and you're on the bed and I went, oh my God, if I could just throw up I would feel better. And it's true. You can feel better. And so I went in and made myself. I remember Jane Fonda taught me bulimia. And I remember reading about Jane Fonda sticking her finger down her throat. And I went, let's try that. So I stuck my finger down my throat. And I was also a a compulsive overeater. And so I went, hmm, I feel better. I bet it'll work for food, too. So that was the turning point. I became a bulimic at that point. I was about 22 years old. And uh, one weekend, I was out camping at a campground in the Outer Banks of North Carolina and getting drunk out of my mind, and I met my future (laughs) ex-husband. And he was, um, we were at a campground the 4th of July weekend, and um, all night we, I don't know why, but we kept running back for one beer at a time, so... I was getting a lot of exercise that night, and we were listening to the band and getting drunk. And, you know, then we were together that night, and then that was the, you know, end of that. And then uh, he lived in Pittsburgh at the time, which, yay, Steelers. I know, there's some Steeler fans in here. That's right. And so, thank you. And uh, so um, I went up to visit him. He came down to visit me, and by Thanksgiving, I was moving to Florida with him. You know, 4th of July, Thanksgiving, reasonable amount of time. I kind of run through a lot of my options in Greensboro, North Carolina, so why not? So I moved to Florida. We moved to the St. Pete Clearwater area and because some friends of his lived there, and um, I got to drink every night. I drank every night. I loved to drink. I loved the way I felt. I didn't like the taste, but I loved to drink, and I thought... This is a normal life. And all of his friends were alcoholics, and they all drank every night. And so we had a very uh, blackout-ish kind of relationship. (laughs) And so he drank every night, too. And God love him. He's still drinking today. And um, that's that's a very sad story. But in between my bulimia and my alcoholism, and I just bring that up because it's part of my story, um, at, at night, we were broke all the time, and um, uh, I was waitressing out. At the, I couldn't get a, a job in my field, and so I was waitressing. And I actually love waitressing because you can drink on the job. <laughs> at the one place where I worked, they encouraged it kind of. And um, so my ex-husband, when we would be together at night, we were always broke. And so if there was... If there was a lot of alcohol, I would make my drinks really strong and make his not very strong. And then if I wanted to binge that night, I would make his really strong and mine not so strong so I could uh, have a binge. And so our marriage just really was just pretty much, it was pretty, I mean, you can just imagine two alcoholics. And um, so eventually I moved out uh, after about three Three years of actually being married, we lived together for two. I moved out and I moved in with some friends at the beach, and we were partying and everything down there. And eventually, I moved out on my own. And just right at the right toward the end of my alcoholism, I was living in a rat-infested one-room place with uh, it had rats, and I couldn't. I was so broke, I couldn't even afford the electricity. And um, And I was working in this place over there, and, you know, I had just tried so many things to make myself feel better, all the usual things, usually a guy. You know, if a guy will just love me, I'll just be okay. And uh, I was, uh, one night I had a, a date with a guy that I was working with. And I don't even remember his name, but he was going to be my next husband. You know, I was planning, 
Yeah, I don't know if you guys know this, but when we date you, we put our first name with your last name to see how it feels. And we we do it on a first date. Let's see. Vicki Jones. No. No, maybe I'll keep O'Grady. Well, anyway, O'Grady was my ex-husband's name. But anyway, so I was planning our kids, little blue-eyed blonde kids. And he had been a, a, a former major league baseball pitcher, you know, so there was my athlete, and I could be his cheerleader, and so we went out on this Friday night, our first date, and uh, I drank beer that night because I didn't want him to think I was an alcoholic, and so I knew that I wouldn't get so drunk on beer as I thought I would get on liquor, hard liquor, so, you know, he came over, we had our little night, and so he said, well, I'll call you tonight, and we'll get together tonight. Well, there was about this much wine left in the bottle of wine from the night before, because I was always broke. I never had any money, and so I wanted to save it for the next night. So I waited and waited and waited and waited, and my future, my next future husband didn't call me that night, and I was trying to sip that wine just in case he called, you know, 9 o'clock, sip a little more, 10 o'clock, sip a little more. 11 o'clock, drink a lot more, you know. I just drank, you know, a half a bottle didn't really do anything for me. And so that night I didn't get drunk. And so the next morning I woke up early. I was usually a late sleeper. I woke up the next morning, and that was February the 18th of 1983. And I was alone, and I wasn't hungover. And... uh The newspaper that morning had an article on alcoholism. Now, my mother had been in recovery. She was dead at this point. She had been dead seven months. And um, she had been in AA, so I'd been to some meetings with her for her to support her, of course. And I knew what AA did for people, but I wasn't an alcoholic. And I looked at this checklist, you know, that little checklist that's over there. And to me, it wasn't, you don't answer those questions yes or no. To me, it was from one to five, you know. And I didn't have a lot of yeses. I had a couple of, well, it's not that bad, and it's kind of like this and this. And I didn't have blackouts. I wasn't arrested. I wasn't calling in sick to work. I was a good employee. Nobody thought I was an alcoholic. I was, you know, I planned all the happy hours at work, but so what? You know, somebody had to get everybody having fun. And so that, you know, I didn't really look at that, give it much thought. And about an hour later, there was a show on TV. And this guy said, well, I'm an alcoholic. I never got a DUI. I never called in sick to work. I didn't have blackouts. And all of a sudden, this thing came over me, and I just started sobbing. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm an alcoholic. Oh, my God, I'm an alcoholic. And I called a friend of mine that I worked with who was in Al-Anon and she and her husband came over and it was his one year anniversary that day and he watched the Tampa Bay Buccaneer game and she 12 stepped me and that night I went to my my first AA meeting and it was called the it was over in Clearwater it was called the 301 Club and it was the under 40 group <laughs> And I was 30 years old, and I was ready for my next husband. Hello. <laughs> and being one of those butt kissery people, Kim, what do you wear to those meetings? Do I have to dress up? No, you don't have to dress up. So we went to the under 40 group at the 301 club, and I'd been crying all day, and I could barely see through my contacts. And now I know it was cigarette smoke, but uh, that's when you used to be able to smoke. I was smoking like a fiend back then. And I looked around the room, and through my tear-stained eyes, there were the most gorgeous men I had ever seen in my life. (laughs) And although I wasn't happy to be there, there were a lot of men in there I was very happy to see. And, um, And it blew my mind because there was a lady there who had a year of sobriety. And that blew my mind. You can go a year without a drink. Oh, my God. It just blew my mind. And a whole bunch of women came up. And back in, in this meeting, the women would just come and throw, give you their numbers. And I just crumpled them all up. And when everybody wasn't looking, I 
threw them in the garbage with my little southern smile. I don't need you. This place is really ridiculous. This is, y'all weren't quite what I had in mind when I thought I wanted to belong. <laughs> I had the debutante in mind, kind of, you know, but anyway, never made the debutantes, but I did make it in here. And after the meeting, after the meeting, there was this guy. His name was Dave. And he was about six foot four. And he was kind of turned to the side like this. And he said to me, Vicky, you keep coming back. And his little, his big old bicep was right in my face. And I knew I was coming back to this meeting. <laughs> oh my God. And so I, I really wasn't that involved, you know. I, I dated a few times in my first year. Well, I want to say when I was two months sober, my divorce became final. And even though I wanted a divorce, I, I didn't expect it to hit me, you know. It hit me like a ton of bricks because it's like even if you don't want to be with the person, it's kind of the end of the dreams and I'd wanted kids and everything and uh, I decided, this is too painful. I'm going to go get drunk, two months sober. And I walked, down the, I walked down the courthouse steps. And there was a lady from AA on those steps. And if I hadn't been going to meetings and known that lady, I would have gotten drunk that day. And she saved me that day. She saved me because I was going through a relationship breakup. And the second time that I wanted to get drunk and had decided to get drunk, it was in my first year, and some guy dumped me. It was a relationship issue. And I decided, I'm going to Albertsons. I live behind in Albertsons. I'm going to Albertsons. And I walked in Albertsons, and there in line was a guy from my beach meeting. And I didn't get drunk that day. And if I hadn't been going to meetings... I wouldn't have seen, I wouldn't have known who that guy was. I would, I might still be drunk. You know, cause I think once you relapse, you just keep giving yourself permission to do it. I, I haven't relapsed in alcoholism, but I did in my eating disorder. And it was like, you know, once you lose that six weeks, it's really easy to give it up. So you don't ever have to lose it the first time. Really, you don't. And so, um, and you know, the thing that I didn't realize then is I walked in to recovery with a really crappy set of relationship skills. I mean, I'm 28 years sober, and I don't know how I'd be in a relationship today, but I darn sure didn't have any good skills that first year. You know, I'm walking in with a drunk person's mind and a drunk person's relationship skills. And and that's the reason that we recommend. I mean, feel free to do it if you just feel compelled, but... It, it, you just can't, you can't do it and, and take care of yourself, you know. I use those steps. These steps right here, they're for me to build a relationship with me. And these are my steps to build a relationship with other people. My sponsor had me go through the big book and substitute wherever it had, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. He made me put my name in there so I would know how to have a relationship with people. But I didn't, you can't have a relationship with a, with another person until you can have one with yourself because you don't feel worthy of another person's love. I have to feel worthy of love. And you know how I get that? I have to do those steps. And so I, I, uh, it took me, it took me about six months to really get involved in the program. And I, I got the meanest sponsor in the room because she talked to me like my dad used to talk to me. And, uh, then I got into, uh, I went through a period of time in my, I was about four and a half years sober, and I, if you really want to get some work done, quit smoking and give up your other addictions, because I was about four and a half years sober, and I had given up all my addictions, and I went into a depression that I don't know where it came from. I I just don't know. I was going to kill myself, really. I had decided I am going to kill myself, because... These emotions, I don't know what to do with them. And so uh, my sponsor recommended that I go into a codependency treatment center, and they saved, saved my life. And uh, I was in there with uh, other recovering people. I needed that help so badly because 
I just had so much abuse, you know. I went through sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse. My mother was on pills. She was like a withholder. I mean, there's nothing worse than being ignored. I'd rather be hit than being ignored. And so I had so much stuff to deal with. I had to get outside help, but I'm grateful for that. But AA is where I get sober. I can't deal with my alcoholism out there. Before I got sober, I was in therapy for four years. Therapy didn't get me sober. AA got me sober. And I just want to say, I, um, I went into that treatment center, and, and I, I came out, and I just was so grateful because I felt so much love and support from people. People really have stood by me all the years of my recovery. And... Um, after this treatment center, I moved to Orlando, and I met Lee. Lee was like my first friend in sobriety here in Orlando. And and uh, we just kind of, it was just, I, he had said something about Clearwater and, ah, you know. And just one by one, I've met people in these rooms, and each person has just been a, a godsend to me. And, uh, you know, back when I got sober, the adult children of alcoholics movement was really big. And I decided that my family needed rehabbing, and I was going to be the one to let them know. Now, keep in mind how much credibility I had in my family. <laughs> Vicky the psycho. <laughs> you don't, you aren't a role model for us, Vic. <laughs> Seriously. And so I went home and had all the family together, and I said, now I would like for us to all get family therapy. And I have a family therapist in Clearwater. We, we can fly him up here. And what he does is he gets the family together and we all get in a big circle and whoever wants to do some work sits in the middle of the circle and we work on them. And my father said, not right that moment, but he basically, he didn't basically say this. He said, you've been a bastard child since the day you were born. <laughs> That's what happens when you impose your values on other people. And so I just have to talk about my dad because really, I, I really meant it when I said my relationship with my dad. You know, my father was so, even pretty much till the last year of his life, he was pretty mean to me. I know I drove him up the wall and because of the work that I was able to do and I've made amends to him for all the things I did to get back at him. He hated cigarette smokes and him smoking, and I smoked four packs a day just to show him. <laughs> and I know he suffered terribly from my cigarette smoking. But anyway, um, I, I just got to the place where, my, I mean, we were in a, one of my nieces got married, and my dad was... We were in the uh, the rehearsal dinner, and I said something, you know, I was doing a little toast, and in front of about 50 people, this was about five years ago, my father said, yeah, that's Vicky. She's been wrecking people's lives all the way from here to Israel for years. Now, if I hadn't been sober... <laughs> I would have caused a scene. I would have looked like the jerk. But because I've done this work, I just sat there and I didn't say anything. And I let him feel the impact of his abuse. And he apologized to me. I said, I know you didn't mean it. It's all right. It wasn't okay, but I was okay. You know what I'm saying? The behavior wasn't okay, but I was okay. And... um. And then my father, you know, even like a couple years before he died, he died last year. He would come in, I, I don't know why, but he just used to love to stand over me and criticize me. And why are you making those biscuits? I bought some biscuits. And why are you making those? I'm like, Dad, I don't have to make them. It's not a big deal. You want me? I, I can put them away. It's not a big deal. My step work did that, you know. I'm powerless over my dad, but I'm not powerless over me. And um, and all the work that I've done, the amends and the six and the seven and the, you know, working with other people, I could do that. I don't have to react to people's anger anymore because mine is cleaned out, you know. I cleaned up mine. I was one of the angriest people I know. 
And mine was cleaned out because I worked my steps and I let you support me. You know, without you, there's no me. You know, without you, hold my hand. And this year, I got to do some kind of going back in time, you know, taking the new Vicky into the old places. And now I can tell you about that 40th high school reunion. <laughs> I went back to my high school reunion. Some of y'all have heard a little bit of this story. I went back, and every guy I dated in high school was either committed suicide or is an alcoholic. Now, that is sad. And I and I had to endure a few hours of people spitting on me, leaning in on me, yelling at me because they were drunk. And there was a time, you know, at my 10th high school reunion, I was drunk and I tripped over a, a fence and I still have a scar on my leg. On my 20th high school reunion, I was sober. And people said, oh, my God, you haven't changed a bit. And I was highly offended by that because <laughs> I'd been working my steps and I was very different. But they, but see, what they, what they found, what they meant is we loved you in high school and we still love you. You're still fun. But see, I thought they were saying, you know, you're still fat, ugly, and stupid. You know, I had to change that. That was 20 years. Well, this year was 40, and I went back there. I'm the new me in the old place. And I was around all those alcoholics. I mean, there were a lot of alcoholics, my old boyfriend being one. And I could sit there. I talked to his wife. He dumped me for her. And I could talk to her and welcome her because I, I didn't want her to feel the way that I felt in high school. Y'all gave me compassion. I felt compassion for her. I didn't want her to feel insecure at that reunion. And I spent some time talking to her. I like her. I'm glad he found somebody, a nice person. And so, and then uh, last month, I've been a Steeler fan for 35 years. And I got to go to my very first Steeler game with my ex-husband's brother. <laughs> now, what's sad about that story, I went up there. I wanted to go up and see the leaves change. I wanted to go see. I loved my ex-husband's family, and they loved me, even as an act of alcohol. They loved me. And my ex-husband's aunt is 98 years old. And I wanted to go surprise her. And I got off the elevator with my ex-husband's brother, and I went, Hi, Aunt Mary. We, we, we still are in touch with each other. She almost fell over. And that night, I heard her on the phone saying, Tonight, when I go to bed, I'm going to cry myself to sleep because nobody's ever done that for me. And I couldn't have done that if I wasn't sober. And my ex-husband's family is estranged from him because he has burned all of them out. And that makes me so sad because he has the most amazing family. And I stayed at my ex-brother-in-law's house. And they know I'm a recovering alcoholic. And, oh, that house was honestly, it was disgusting. He and his wife smoke. They, it's like they've been chain smoking in that house nonstop for 25 years and haven't ever opened the windows. And after two days, my nose was bleeding. <laughs> And, uh, and they didn't, I mean, they took, as soon as they finished coffee, they started drinking. You know, it's like they went straight from coffee to beer. And uh, my, I, but I did learn something from my ex-brother-in-law and his alcoholism. I had a theory when I was drinking that if you drank alcohol, it would get rid of your cigarette breath. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, it was a lie. <laughs> Because he breathed on me through the whole game. <laughs> but as I was at a Steeler game, and it was like, for me, it was like 
being at a at an international AA convention, you know, being reunited with my peeps after 35 years, and I'm gonna do it every year. I'm not staying with him. <laughs> but so last July, a year ago, July, my dad fell and hit his head and broke his hip and. They didn't do an MRI, so he was bleeding in the brain because he was taking blood thinners. And so my family called me up and said, you know, it doesn't look good, come up. And so I went up and I made it, I made it like just, just in time before he went into a coma. And my dad was scared for the first time I've ever known him. He was scared. <laughs> And all the years of abuse were erased in that moment because I don't care who you are. When somebody's scared, you want to protect them. And my dad was not protected as a little boy. He was, he had the crap beat out of him. And when he took his last breath. I just wanted to hold him. And I had one arm up underneath the pillow, and I had another hand on his chest. And I just felt like I was cheering him on. I'm like, Dad, you can do it. Just go. Don't suffer. And there was not an unspoken word between us. And I was sitting in the meeting one day, and I was thinking... I wish he had apologized. I just wanted to hear those words. I'm sorry. I know how I treated you. And because I was sitting in a meeting, I heard the words. It was already cleaned up. You don't need that. It was already cleaned up. You don't need those words to go on. You don't need anything from anyone else to be whole and complete And you do deserve your own love. And it just, you're lovable, even if you hate yourself. But please use this program to fall madly in love with yourself. It's possible. If you're new, I just want to share this. I was in a meeting the other day, and the topic, thanks to Mikey over there, was the grace of God. And I hear people say all the time, I'm sober by the grace of God. But there's something that doesn't fit right about that to me because everybody has the grace of God. We all have it. God loves us all equally. God doesn't have a favorite. And I was looking at this white chip, and I'm like, this is the grace chip. This is your sign from God that he loves you. He loves us all. And if you'll do the steps, you can stay sober. But if you do the steps, you feel the grace of God and you feel worthy of it. And so if you're new, you grab onto this and feel the presence of God when you feel this because you're so loved. And there's nothing that you are going to feel from getting drunk that is going to make you feel better. You're just going to feel better for a little while and then you're going to act terribly. And you deserve recovery. Everybody, There's nothing you've done that is so bad that you don't deserve to feel good and be with us, we put our arms around you. And thank you for putting your arms around me and keeping me sober for 28 years. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.